This video conference is on the novel coronavirus, and it is an informational class that deals with this virus and the pandemic and things that we can do to address this. Today is March 14th, so all the information I give you now is current as of this date. The clearest thing to say right up front is we still do not know precisely as much about this virus and the way it behaves as we would like. But we have learned a tremendous amount in the last six weeks, even in the last two weeks. Our understanding has improved enough that we can make better recommendations and predictions in how to work with this virus. Now, the virus itself is very similar in structure to some of the previous viruses that you may have heard of. The SARS virus, uh, S-A-R-S, which caused significant uh, health issues back in 2003, uh, is also a coronavirus, quite uh, similar in structure to uh, our current novel coronavirus, sometimes called the Wuhan uh, coronavirus, marking its origin. And the SARS viruses are similar enough that they are, they're actually calling this novel coronavirus uh, SARS-2 or SARS-2. Another similar virus to our current novel coronavirus is the MERS virus. Remember, that was the virus that uh, back around 2009 called the Middle e caused the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome that was so serious. Now, all the viruses I just mentioned are coronaviruses. Coronaviruses are many include many different types of viruses. Um, also included among the uh, coronaviruses are some of the viruses that cause the common cold. Probably uh, somewhere between 25 and 50 percent of common colds, which you know are not serious. Generally, people often don't even get a fever. They may just get a runny nose and some congestion, maybe feel a little under the weather, a little physically uh, fatigued, um, but generally they're brief, run their course with no uh, long-term side effect. Um, those are, in addition, coronaviruses, but this is a specific one. We call it a novel coronavirus because the world has never seen this before. It is one of the problems with the fact that it is brand new because there is no immunity in the world for this. Um, for some of the other coronaviruses that have been around for probably millennia, people have developed some immunity to them because there have been previous infections. Let's talk a little bit about um, the SARS-2 uh, virus itself, this novel coronavirus, to understand it a little bit better. Um, normally, we talk about the name of the virus as I just gave it. The illness it cause, causes is called COVID-19 for coronavirus disease 19. It started in 2019 in December in Wuhan, China. That's why it's given that particular name. So you will likely hear all the kind of references I've just made to the virus, and it really is referring to the same thing. Um, the virus itself exists as virus particles. Remember, technically, viruses aren't alive. They're um, small pieces, in this case, small pieces of RNA protein, microscopic, that have a little fat envelope that helps protect them. And they're transmitted from uh, organ, from uh, animal to animal or animal to human or human to human. And when they get into a host, they're actually able to take advantage of the normal cells in that person's body, the machinery in those cells to replicate themselves and often cause some disease or symptoms uh, as a part of that infection. One thing that it's helpful to realize right at the outset that these virus particles are not invincible. They're actually easily destabilized with some very simple things. For example, uh, our standard soaps, 
uh, break down the little fat envelope that the virus uh, is existing in. And so the simple thing of washing your hands or washing your um, utensils and um, um, uh, eating wear uh, does actually destabilize the virus so that it cannot replicate. It's one of the reasons we recommend hand washing um, because it's so effective. Also, any of the, dis the disinfectants that are used for uh, coronaviruses, uh, including uh, high percentage disinfectant uh, that are based on alcohol, many of your hand sanitizers that people will use um, have a high percentage of alcohol, usually over 70%. And it's the alcohol that affects the little piece of protein uh, in the virus particle and makes it so it can't replicate it actually, um, in, uh, makes it ineffective. We do know that uh, these kind of viruses are somewhat, sem somewhat sensitive to temperature and they're also sensitive to humidity. Um, right now, we don't know enough to make too much comment for the novel coronavirus about how that might play into our treatment recommendations. I always like to mention that because it may be that that will be a little more important in the future uh, in how we work with the coronavirus. Well, what happens when someone is exposed to the coronavirus? Um, you're actually in close proximity, um, uh, working all day uh, in an office setting, talking closely with someone, and it turns out uh, that this person actually has COVID-19 and you have been exposed. And we'll just say for um, our example here that in fact you got infected. What happens initially is after you've been infected with the virus, you now have it in your body and it is replicating, uh, there is an incubation period. The incubation period is a time while the virus is replicating in your body, but you do not yet have symptoms. Um, for example, for influenza, influenza is not one of the coronaviruses. It's a different class of viruses, but we have much more familiarity with it. So you'll hear me often mention the influenza viruses, for example. For example, with influenza viruses, from the moment you get infected with it to, to when you develop symptoms is about two days. Uh, it comes on very uh, rapidly. With the coronavirus, it's a little more difficult because there's more of a delay. It seems based on the studies that have been done to date that the incubation period of no symptoms uh, may range from five days up to a full 14 days. It looks like most likely it's five to nine days. So that means for that at least first five days that someone may be infected and potentially infectious to others before they even develop any symptoms. And so you can see this really makes uh, our ability to um, control infections more difficult because people don't realize they're infected yet and they may be uh, potentially spreading the virus. The studies that we have seen are showing that although people are much more likely to spread the virus when they already have symptoms um, and they're showing all the signs of COVID-19 infection, during this incubation period, they may in fact be infective. So there will be more understanding of this, but so far that does seem to be the case. Uh, normally when someone uh, has COVID-19 uh, infection, we ask that person to isolate, that is be by themselves so others are not having contact with uh, them physically or any of their body fluids, their um, mucus or saliva or sputum, urine or feces, because virus is found in all those things uh, while they're infected. And so we call that putting an individual in isolation. And that's done for someone who has infection. If you're someone who has had a close exposure 
to a patient who has COVID-19, you may be asked to quarantine. Quarantine means you've been exposed, but you currently do not have symptoms. So isolation is people who are already sick and have symptoms. Quarantine is for those who, with exposure that we want to uh, make sure we keep separate long enough that it's clear they will not develop symptoms. Right now, the quarantine period that's recommended for people who've had exposure to uh, the COVID-19 virus is 14 days. We think this is enough. Um, that may change over time as we get uh, more, more understanding of this. Well, what happens when someone develops the COVID-19 symptoms. Well, we've already talked about initially they get infected, the virus is replicating in their body, and at somewhere around five to nine days, they begin developing symptoms. And the symptoms are generally um, respiratory, some low-grade fever, fatigue, and muscle aches. Now, it the respiratory symptoms people get can include cold-like symptoms with runny nose. It can include sore throat. It can include a dry hacking cough. Um, and the presentation on this is quite variable. So you can't say, for example, oh, well, this person has cold symptoms, but they have no fever. So uh, COVID-19 is not possible. Um, someone can have a fever with no other symptoms and have COVID-19. Someone can just have mild cold-like symptoms, a runny nose, itchy eyes, and that could in fact be a very low symptomatic case of COVID-19. So you can see from a diagnosis standpoint, it makes it very difficult for um, us as physicians trying to sort out who we should test and who um, needs to be isolated to prevent further spread. Now, right now we are suspecting that roughly 25% of people who get COVID-19 infections may never have any symptoms. They will be asymptomatic with this. This may be even more true in children. They appear to have milder disease than young adults and older adults. Um, but again, there's some variability with this. I only mention this so that we're all remembering that just because someone has no symptoms doesn't mean they can't be potentially a in, uh, infective to others, either because they're in an incubation period without symptoms or because they have an asymptomatic case. So it really makes us want to have um, restrictions on how we interact with each other that take into account that we may be dealing with people who do not realize that they are infectious to others. If we look at people who actually develop symptoms of COVID-19 virus, roughly 80% of them are going to have what we would call mild or moderate symptoms. Basically, they may feel under the weather, funky, muscle aches, have a fever, definitely not want to go out and do anything, um, and would be happy to take things that uh, would help ease their muscle aches like um, acetaminophen or ibuprofen or their favorite herbal remedy uh, to help with their symptoms. Typically, after about 10 days, they will get well and go on to pursue a complete recovery course without any additional symptoms um, or persistent symptoms that linger. Uh, that's about 80%. About 20% will have more serious disease. These are people that may well need hospitalization. You can see with the COVID-19 virus, this is very significant because often when people have uh, infections like with the influenza virus, the percentage of people that could require hospitalization is much, much lower. It's down in the few percent range. Um, whereas this is as high as 20% in what we have seen so far. Uh, of the people who develop COVID-19 symptomatically, 
about 20% are going to end up in the hospital, and about a quarter of those, or 5% of the total, of people who get symptoms will be sick enough that they will end up in the intensive care unit and need very intensive therapies, often ventilator therapy where we breathe for them. Well, why is why are people needing this more intensive care and hospitalization? Well, it turns out that about a week into the COVID-19 symptomatic period, people are, who are going to have more significant illness begin experiencing more respiratory symptoms. They begin to feel short of breath, more congestion in their chest, and at some point, their blood oxygen levels begin to fall because they can't exchange enough oxygen with the air um, to keep their oxygen blood levels uh, elevated. So that's the point at which someone's going to be in the hospital because they at least need supplemental oxygen, often by nasal cannula. And about a quarter of those people in the hospital are going to end up in the ICU with um, more invasive treatments, typically a ventilator, something that will actually breathe for them. So the pneumonia that occurs with COVID-19 is actually the primary worry with this. In people that are in the ICU, a certain percentage of, the, percentage of them will go on to get um, what we call multi-system organ failure, where not only do their lungs begin having trouble like this, but we find that there's kidney failure and liver failure as well. Often those people are so seriously ill, they do not survive. Um, the overall fatality rate from this virus is much higher than we would like to see. To put this in uh, perspective, during uh, your typical year's uh, flu uh, influenza outbreak, where people are getting influenza and a small percentage end up in the hospital, some in the intensive care unit, when we look back at the end of the year, we'll probably see that about 0.1% of people who caught influenza got sick enough with it that they died. Most of those people are very old. Typical person to die from influenza would be someone in a nursing home. Um, or they're very young, often children under one year old. One little bright spot on COVID-19 is children do seem to be spared when they get sick. We have not seen significant fatalities in very young children, babies, um, and even in teenagers, a very limited um, serious complication in those age groups. However, in older patients, particularly people over age 50, the risk begins increasing. The older the patient, the more likely they're going to have a more serious complication. If we used as an example for COVID-19, someone who was 20 years old, probably their chance of a fatality from this is 0.1% or less. If we look at someone who is 80 years old and they catch this, the fatality rate may be between five and 10%. Um, you'll see as we get into how we work with this that the reason that it is so focused and so damaging on our older patients, that's the group of patients that we really wanna make sure we protect well and don't let them get sick because their chance of fatality is so high. Now, when a, a patient first develops their um, COVID-19 symptoms, they've got runny nose, maybe they've got a dry cough, they've got this little low-grade fever, they're actually shedding the virus in their nasal mucus, um, in their saliva, uh, it's even in their stool and in their urine. So every, everything that they're secreting is infective to others. And so we want to make sure when someone has active symptoms that they are wearing a mask when they are around other people um, to, mean, to make so that they won't um, spread by um, coughing or um, 
breathing excess excessively in other people. And we also uh, want to make sure that we're limiting physical contact with other people and that they're careful that if they're using a bathroom that other people may be using, that they wipe down the toilet seat and counter in the bathroom with a disinfectant when they're done using the bathroom. The outcomes with the COVID-19 virus, particularly around fatality rates, um, is very much dependent on how healthy the healthcare system is. If the healthcare system is intact and functioning well, and that there are still plenty of beds in a hospital for sicker patients who do need hospitalization, primary, primarily supplemental oxygen, that there is wide ava ava availability of that, the fatality rate potentially can stay very low. Right now in uh, South Korea, their healthcare system is staying well ahead of the infection, so everyone who needs treatment is getting it in a hospital setting. And their fatality rate is really quite low. It's around 0.5% in some of the recent studies, um, which is only about uh, five times greater than influenza. Remember, influenza was 0.1%. The fatality rate from this is about 0.5% with a really uh, excellent healthcare system there to serve them. If the healthcare system begins to fail, um, there's not enough um, healthy uh, healthcare providers available to take care of people, or there aren't enough hospital beds, or there aren't enough oxygen setups, or oxygen supply, or not enough ventilators the death rate does accelerate and become higher. Um, right now in places like Iran, where the uh, healthcare system has been oversaturated by ill people, the death rate is much closer to 9%. So the fatality rate that we talk about is very much dependent on the health of the healthcare system and whether it is intact and still functioning. You can see it makes such a difference if we start uh, right at the beginning and prevent people from getting sick. It means that sick per that person, if they never if they never get the virus, it means they can't pass it to anyone else. They themselves cannot get sick at all, and they will not end up using hospital services or ICU services, let alone the fact that they've avoided dying from it. So that's part of our reason for wanting to be so sure that we keep people healthy and make sure that they do not get sick. As I said, the fatalities are highest in those people that are over age 50. And for every year older someone is, um, their risk for a more serious outcome increases. So a 50-year-old will tend to do better than someone 60, who will do better than someone who's 70, who will do better than someone who's 80. In fact, in the United States, most of the fatalities have been in really elderly patients, people over age 80. Um, one thing I'd say for all of you who are yoga practitioners and who practice meditation chronologically, uh, your age may in fact be about five to 10 years older than your biological age. We find that people who practice meditation and yoga often are younger by about five to 10 years biologically than the um, age as determined by their birth certificate. So one happy bit of news in this. This is part of the reason with um, the fact that this strikes the elderly uh, much more, severe, more severely that many of the fatalities that you are reading about right now in the news have occurred in people who are in nursing homes and were already quite elderly. But there are some people in their 20s and 30s who have died from this. The fatality rate for someone in their 20s and 30s is probably around in the 0.1% range. I'm often asked, are there any long-term effects from having had this infection? And right now, that is something we are really just learning about. In some of the, the information we're seeing coming out of Hong Kong, where they've had some experience with this now, is some of the people who've had more serious infections um, end up with breathing difficulty afterwards. 
they've completely recovered from the virus. They do not need to be in the hospital, but they still complain of feeling short of breath and get short of breath easily when they walk. I think we will know more in the coming weeks what is causing that and if there's anything we can do to help with that. Um, there may be other systemic effects that this causes as a more permanent uh, problem for people after they've had the infection, including some nervous system problems. But this is still a little bit theoretical. I don't have information for you on that yet. Well, when someone uh, has a mild to moderate case, about how long are they going to be symptomatic and shedding the virus whether other people can easily catch it? Well, it turns out it's for about 10 days. And even if they are shedding the virus after that, we're actually very suspicious that those virus particles are not healthy enough to replicate. I would say right now, um, I would not take that 10 day mark as, okay, you've made it 10 days, you can be around anybody. I would just say, that is a very hopeful sign that we may be able, with people who have milder symptoms, uh, to let them return to normal activity and be around others um, at the 10-day mark. For people who've had um, more serious um, COVID-19 infections where they've landed in the hospital um, or they've had really a very prolonged illness, it looks like it could be up to 37 days after they first developed symptoms when they would be more virus-free. <clears throat> How about reinfections after the initial bout of infection? Well, there's some good news on that. It's appearing, as we begin to get more data, that people who have this infection afterwards uh, have immunity to it. I would say this is still um, this is still information that is in progress. I think it is very hopeful that that will be the case, and I think we will know soon whether we can say that for the vast majority of people once they've had it once, they will not get it again in the future. I know one thing we're seeing in the medical community is there's actually talk of organizing people who've already had the COVID-19 virus um, who are now immune and having them go into uh, situations where we need people who can work without fear of getting infected or passing infection to others and have them be able to work where no one else could work because they're at risk of getting the disease. So it's actually looking very hopeful that once you've been infected, you will not get infected again. And I just touched my face, which I should not have done. Um, we're trying not to touch our face, mouth, uh, uh, anything on our head with our fingers, because often we've contacted things with our hands and we do not want to touch our face. So um, I did that and I've been trying hard not to do it. So I thought I'd point it out to you that that was not something I should have done. How about transmission? How does it pass from one person to another? So someone has COVID-19 virus, they're sick with it, and if they contact a surface, particularly a hard surface like uh, a countertop or a table, the virus is now on the surface of uh, that table or countertop. And it can actually remain viable. That is, it could be infective um, for at least two hours and possibly as long as nine days. Right now, that is a very controversial figure. What I'm telling my patients is you should assume that any common surface, like when you go to the, uh, the grocery store and you're buying groceries and perhaps using a push cart, that the handle of that push cart touched by other people may in fact be infective. So you want to wipe it down with a disinfectant cloth, what they often provide there. Or if um, you're out driving your own vehicle and you're pumping gas for your car, putting petrol in your vehicle, you may want to wipe down the handle before you grasp it or put um, disposable gloves on before you grab it um, because you don't want to catch anything from that plastic handle since the virus may be living there. Um, it does not look like the virus will necessarily penetrate through your skin. The problem is once it's on your skin, if you go and touch your face after that, 
then there's a chance it will get in through your mouth, nose, or eyes, which are kind of the main portals to let this in. If you have significant cracking in your skin, it actually could get through the skin of your hands. So direct contact is one way of passing it. Probably not the main one. Um, much more commonly passed by what we call droplet infection. That is when someone who has the virus coughs or sneezes that a cloud of very fine particles of um, uh, mucus or um, uh, saliva that are laden with the virus land on someone's eyes, nose, or mouth mucous membranes and passes the virus that way. That's what we'd call droplet transmission. That's why we recommend strongly that if people are sick, they wear a mask. And I'll actually give you a demonstration of a kind of mask to wear if you are ill. Obviously, if you're ill as much as possible, we want you to stay home. You should not be going out to work or visiting people while you have symptoms. You want to stay home for this and even wear a mask when you're around family members because you are putting their, them at risk. Um, so droplet transmission is probably the most common way this is passed. One last thing, it does appear that the um, COVID-19 virus may be transmitted in what we call an airborne or aerosol fashion. That is, people that are highly infected, just breathing, may exhale the virus. You'll see the um, fact that we think this is occurring, that we're asking people to stay two meters away from each other, six feet, because it lessens the risk that even if there is airborne transmission uh, like this, that it will be in high enough a concentrate high enough concentration to affect someone who is uh, six feet away. So the main thing is droplet transmission, less so with contact transmission from a surface, um, and that's e much more easily mitigated. Um, and lastly, there is this worrisome thing of airborne transmission, so distancing does help. Well, what are transmission rates like? Uh, when we talk about transmission rates, we're usually talking about how many people an individual will likely make sick if they have the virus in a specific environment, you know, in a specific uh, population. Uh, so, for example, um, for the measles virus, which has been largely eradicated throughout the world, it's a highly infective um, virus, and it has a transmission rate of about seven. A person with measles is likely to give it to, to about seven other individuals. For standard influenza, like the outbreak we're having right now in the United States, that number is about two. They're likely to infect about two people. This transmission rate we're talking about is often uh, called by people who study viruses and their medical impacts. We call them epidemiologists. This number is called the r naught. It's just a capital R with a zero after it, r naught. And that is this transmission rate. Um, for the COVID-19 virus, this number is between two and seven. You noticed I just gave you a range. Two is at the low end, pretty similar to influenza, but it can go all the way up to seven. And what this tells us is we're dealing with a virus that is potentially highly infective for other people. Here's some good news with this. This number of transmission rate, the r naught, is not a defined number that is unique to that virus. It's very much dependent on how everyone around that person who is sick with the virus is working with infected people. And so it's, in fact, a variable number. If everyone is being very careful and doing all best practices to avoid infection themselves, it tends to drop 
this R0 number, this transmission rate to a lower level. If people are being particularly so, uh, sloppy and just not caring at all and doing all their normal kinds of interactions, maybe going out of their way to hug and kiss everybody, um, it may in fact be higher than that seven level that we just talked about. We said R0 between two and seven. You could actually make it higher than seven if you were just overly interactive with other people. Well, do, do these kinds of interventions that um, we're going to be talking about really make a difference in the transmission rate, this R0 number? And the fact is they do. In fact, our best example of this was the original SARS infection back in 2003. When they first discovered SARS and people were dying from it, the uh, R0 or tr transmission rate was over 2.0 for that. So it was a lot like influenza in how it was passed. They brought in very strict controls as they began to understand the virus better. And by the end of the whole SARS outbreak, they had that transmission rate number, the R0, down to 0 0.02, which is almost nothing. And that was done purely by um, strict controls uh, for infection. So our goal in working with the COVID-19 virus is what are things that we can do that will reduce the transmission rate, reduce the R0. Well, we have some very good examples for us because right now in uh, the world, we have two ex excellent examples of great responses to the COVID-19 virus. The two I, I am most impressed with are Singapore and South Korea, although there are uh, several other countries you could include as well, Taiwan being another one, who caught this infection uh, process happening early. They watched what was happening in China when they realized that they had infections on their own soil. They brought into play many of the kinds of transmission uh, protections that, we'll, that we will talk about today. Um, and they began testing very aggressively. They tried to test as many people with symptoms as possible to find any active cases of COVID-19. Now, when they found a case of COVID-19, they would make sure they spoke with everyone who had had contact with that patient. And not only would they put the patient who was sick into isolation, but they would ask all their contacts to go into quarantine for two weeks and then would monitor those people to make sure that they did not get ill themselves. And after two weeks, if they were better, uh, after two weeks, they'd show no symptoms at all. Um, they would actually release them from quarantine. This has been highly effective because what we've seen in both Singapore and South Korea is that their numbers have largely leveled off. Um, they are still seeing some growth in their numbers, for example, in South Korea for new cases, but it is a very slow growth. Um, what we've also seen with this is that in Singapore and South Korea, their healthcare systems have not been overloaded because they've been able to keep the number of infections at a low enough level that there's still hospital beds and there's still ICU beds for those who need it. If we want to look at situations that have been much more dire, we can look at Italy, Iran, and even in the United States, in Washington state, where there have been much more explosive increases in the number of cases. And we are trying to respond, in some cases a little late, um, to these infections. In Iran, the healthcare system is already completely overwhelmed. In Italy, it is at the brink of being overwhelmed. And I think we should all hold them in our prayers because they're excellent healthcare system in Italy is really struggling with keeping up with the demand for care for the elderly that are very ill with this and need hospitalization. There are many countries in the world right now, over 120, who have infections um, with citizens who are on their soil. Um, and many countries are taking very uh, draconian, uh, aggressive steps to halt explosion of this infection. Uh, for example, the country of Spain did today just um, 
mirrored many other countries who've had this and they've instituted a full a full lockdown in the country. Many countries have begun limiting any kind of travel from areas of the world where there are significant numbers of cases. For example, early on in the United States, um, we stopped travel coming to us from China when it was really a question whether um, cases could be coming here. Um, very recently, we included Italy and now all of Europe in that. And today, they also added the United Kingdom. Um, that those people cannot travel here to the United States. Um, you just have to look country to, by country to see what the restrictions are in any specific country now. Some countries have gone as far as just closing their borders completely and not letting anybody in or out, um, just as a very aggressive way of blocking any further growth with this. Growth, growth with this. Let me talk a little bit about why viruses like this are so worrisome. And it has to do with how quickly they can spread if they're highly infectious like this. And it is something that as human beings, we're not really prepared for. In most of the things that we deal with in our lives, things tend to respond in what we call a linear fashion. Um, that is, if um, you want to um, boil a pan of water on your stove and you have a little gas range with flames that come up, you know that if you set the flame at a very low level, the water will heat up very slowly. If you set it at a very high level, it will heat up faster. And there's uh, what we would call a linear relationship between how much flame there is and how fast it will heat the water. Um, for example, if you were going to boil some water and you set it at a high flame and put the water on it, you know, probably over about four minutes, the water would get hotter and hotter. Initially, you could even stick your finger in the water. Eventually, it would become too hot and eventually it would start boiling after about four minutes. Well, the temperature increase, if we looked at that on a graph of time and temperature, as time on the bottom here is going by, temperature is going up, but it's going in a straight line. It's what we call a linear increase until it actually is boiling here. Okay. So that's the kind of thing we deal with in our world constantly um, and what we're used to. Here's the problem with things that have an exponential function, they grow much more explosively. Let me give you another example, an example of an exponential expansion of something or exponential change would be, take the example of, let's say you had a pile of wood that you needed to burn. Um, it was brushed that you've cleared and now you're going to get rid of it by burning it. And it's this big in diameter. And you're a little worried about getting the fire started, so you decide to pour um, uh, a cup of gasoline on it, a cup of petrol, um, to make it easier to start. Now here you have your little match and you stand back <laughs> and drop it on and the whole burn pile will immediately burst into flame. In fact, if you did it, you, if you took a slow motion picture, you would see it would start right where the match hit but it rapidly spend, uh, expands out to include the whole burn pile and um, it uh, starts burning in a very explosive way. That's an exponential increase. So linear versus exponential. We're not used to exponential things and how they work because they go from not much happening, just a match in your hand, to an explosive fire in a very short period of time. That's the problem with um, viruses like this that have a high transmission rate is the time it takes for one person to have it and hundreds to have it can be just a few weeks. Right now with what we're understanding about the COVID-19 virus, the doubling time, that is the time where the number of known confirmed cases to double 
become twice as much seems to be about five to seven days. Um, in the United States, it's growing by about 16 to 20 percent a day, which if you actually um, calculate that out, you'll see in five to seven days, if it's growing by 16 to 20 percent a day, it's doubled every five to seven days. Um, well, even though you may start off with 30 cases, if you keep doubling that, um, after four cycles of that, after uh, 20, 21 days or so, you'll have 16 times as many cases as that 30 that you 30 cases that you started with. So in a very short period of time, it has grown explosively. That's why we have to catch this early and begin instituting measures that block the transmission and keep people safe. One thing I am warning people is that usually when we begin to institute these kinds of measures where we're trying to protect everyone, there will be still a period of time where the growth rate of the viral infections will still be exponential. So remember how we talked about um, that example of boiling water on the, on the stove? And uh, if this is temperature here and this is time here, it was going to be a linear relationship, just a nice straight line until it boils. Okay, well, let's now take the example of um, time down here in days, where this is about a week here, just for example. Um, and this is the number of cases here. What happens during a COVID-19 pandemic is you start off with a few cases down here and gradually the growth rate is pretty slow right in the beginning, but after about five to 10 days, you begin seeing it go up and then the growth rate accelerates. So you get out here three or four weeks and suddenly the number of cases is moving up like this. So instead of a linear increase, it's an exponential increase. Now, when we realize that we have potentially an exponential problem on our hand, what we do is institute the kind of measures we're suggesting everyone do. And I'll go through those in just a moment. But what happens is, in response to that, that initially we've begun doing all these things. It continues in an exponential fashion until all of a sudden, because everyone's being more careful, there aren't as many people who it can be passed to. And instead of going up like this until 50, 60, 70% of the entire population has been infected, instead of that happening, because we're not giving anybody to be easily infected, we begin leveling off. So it does this, it starts up exponentially, we make our interventions, and it begins to flatten out. This is what happened in South Korea. I mean, it's a very elegant thing to see when you see a graph of this because it shows you these kind of interventions actually work. We call this flattening. We call it flattening the curve. Instead of an exponential curve, we want to flatten that curve. So we're reducing transmission and it flattens this curve out. When we flatten the curve, we preserve our ICU beds, we preserve our hospital beds for the sickest of the sick, and there'll be enough beds and health care for them. So how do we test for this? You know, we're fortunate with influenza that we have uh, simple in-office tests. If someone comes into my medical office, uh, into my health center, uh, and we think they have influenza, we do a little throat swab on them, and I can tell them in 10 minutes whether they have influenza. Right now, we have a much more complicated test. We actually have to use a test, it's called PCR, that um, multiplies the number of virus particles that we've collected on a swab that we've gotten from the patient's throat, uh, who, who, let's just say they have COVID-19. We've uh, swabbed it from their throat, there's not enough virus particles there for us to test. And so we put it through um, a test that dramatically multiplies the number of particles, and then there is enough for us to easily test. The tests right now are taking between one and four days here in the United States. There's 
uh, some good technology that may get that down to faster. I just saw one today that is aiming to be uh, readable in about four hours. And I think we will only see improvement on that front. I'm really looking forward to when someone comes to our office and they're sick, that I can uh, test them for influenza and test them for COVID-19 um, and give them their results before they're ready to leave in 10 minutes. But right now it's at least one day, possibly four days until they, weren't, they will know. Some good news here in the United States is that many of the large pharmacy chains, the chemist chains in the United States, CVS Pharmacy, Target, and Walmart are all going to be offering uh, in parking lot drive up testing, which is a very elegant way to do it. It really limits the exposure of the healthcare staff because the person drives up, they roll down the window of their car, they do not get out. They reach in, swab their throat, the window goes back up, and the person drives off. So very limited exposure to other people. And if they're that symptomatic, we're telling them to go home and isolate until they get their results. Um, and when they get the results in four days, we know what we can what we can offer them. So testing has been very limited here in the United States. Um, I know when I had asked here in our local county where I am, I'm in Nevada County at Ananda Village, um, it's a county of about 90,000 people. When I asked them, how many tests have you performed um, on, this was two days ago, they had, done 11, they had done 10 tests. And this is a county with 90,000 people in it. So we've had almost no testing here. So we're going to get a much better idea here in the United States, really the depth and breadth of this infection, this pandemic, as we're able to do more testing and we can see more. Right now, we have a very poor idea of how many cases there are actually in the community. So it is good to pay attention to the results of these kinds of testing things. And if you qualify for testing, um, and it will most places that are offering testing in the United States, they do have a number of symptoms that they recommend that each person have as criteria before we can consider testing them because we still don't have as many tests as we would like. Even though um, there's already a million tests that have been distributed in the United States and millions more are on the way, we sh really should be saving those for people who are at the highest risk for actually having an infection. Currently, they have symptoms. And eventually, that will get relaxed even further. So how do we prevent um, transmitting this virus to other people. And this will be the end of my lecture. And I wanted to go through the common sense things for you. Many of these you're already aware of, but let me just go through them quickly. First thing is, and this is kind of the cornerstone, is social distancing. That is, you want to stay physically away from other people. Um, the recommended distance is six feet or two meters. And at that distance, it seems that really reduces the risk of any contact type transmission, droplet type transmission, as well as aerosol or just airborne transmission of the virus. Obviously, we recommend against any kissing, handshakes, pats on the back. I tell my patients I do not recommend elbow bumps, fist bumps, hand slaps, um, really not what we should be doing right now. If you're close enough to bump elbows with somebody, you're probably too close. So we recommend the full six feet. Second thing, train yourself not to touch your face. I'm actually glad I did that once during this talk so you could see how easy it is to do. Um, and it's something we just have to get used to. Uh, if you need to scratch something on your face, use your sleeve. If you have an itch on your forehead and you must scratch it, Scratch it way up your sleeve, not with your hands, because you don't want to have anything on your hands get onto your face. If you must cough, cough into your elbow. Um, if you can turn away from other people when you do it, that is helpful as well. Do not cough into your hand. Um, I would avoid being in groups if you can do that. If you can telecommute for work, please do it. Um, we're asking our schools here in the Ananda school system to stop meeting. We've actually canceled classes for them, and it will happen by video conferencing now. Also, 
all our um, church meetings for Sunday service and other kinds of classes we're doing by video conferencing now and not by in-person classes, again, to avoid putting groups of people together. Um, if you, it is essential that you meet with other people, um, try to keep it to very small groups and spread out. I know just yesterday, um, we had a meeting at my medical office with staff to explain a lot of this stuff. And as a minimum, we, a minimum, we made everyone sit, um, three to six feet apart. Um, that was kind of our best option. I think for future meetings, we'll probably spread out through the entire office and do it by video conferencing throughout the office rather than putting us all together even in one room. That's a better way to do it where we'll decrease risk of transmission. How about travel? Well, I would say to you right now, this is on March 14th, that unless you have travel that is absolutely essential, that you should not be traveling. So um, I would not recommend using public transport at this point. I would not recommend international air travel. Uh, I would not recommend, recommend domestic airline travel unless it is really essential. And if it is essential, you ab absolutely must go. Um, please take every precaution you possibly can, including wearing a mask. I would make these prohibitions even stronger for anyone who's age 60 or older. Um, if you're age 70, I would just say, please, please do not travel. I'd, you're going to have to convince me how essential it is because you're really putting your life at risk if you're traveling and getting exposed and you're in that age range. Um, other things that you can do that are very helpful, you've probably already seen this, washing your hands frequently really does help. Remember the virus particle is a little fatty envelope with a piece of RNA protein in it. That's, that's how it is viable and can transmit. And any soap will break down that fatty envelope so it can't replicate. So you can use your glycerin soap, you can use your aloe vera soap, um, you can use dishwashing soap, detergent. They all work great. It does not have to be something antibacterial. There are no bacteria involved here. You can use something inexpensive. I do recommend that you use soap that only you use. Uh, if you use bar soap, you have your own bar of soap. That's your bar of soap. No one else touches it. Obviously, um, trying to use disposable drying towels um, like paper towels is superior than having uh, uh, a cloth towel that you use to dry on. Um, the cloth towels should never be shared. If you have to use a cloth towel because you have no other alternative, it is your towel and only you use it. No one else touches it because towels can uh, hold the virus and end up transmitting to other people. We do recommend that any common surfaces get uh, cleaned with a disinfectant, uh, once in every 24 hours. I know at my work in a health center, we clean all the common services after every patient. And I even clean my own keyboard and my mouse that I uh, do my electronic data entry with, with a disinfectant wipe at the end of the morning and the end of the afternoon, just to make sure I'm keeping that all nice and sterile. Well, what about face masks? Um, if this was a perfect world, I would love for everyone to be born with a pack of 50 disposable face masks that they would have with them right now. And we could just have everyone wear masks from this moment going forward until this infection is resolved. Unfortunately, there is a serious shortage of face masks. And so we have to start with our highest risk people first. That would include people that work in the healthcare professions because we're at very high risk exposure. I mean, literally, we're dealing with people that will cough right on us as we examine them. So we must always be wearing a face mask because of our, our risk for exposure. I would also say anyone who is taking care of someone who is sick with COVID-19, when there are around that person, they should be wearing an N95 style face mask. Um, there are less expensive face masks available. 
Often we call these ear loop style surgical face masks, and I have an example of that I'm going to show you today, because these are likely going to be more available. I'll be honest, it is not clear whether the N95 mask is necessarily any better than a regular inexpensive surgical mask. And even in our healthcare setting, because uh, of fitting problems, some of our staff are using regular surgical masks because the N95 masks do not fit properly. Um, and it's not really clear that the N95 is that much superior. So I would say any kind of face covering would be helpful. The third group that we usually recommend uh, wear face masks are people that are sick. So it's healthcare providers, uh, people who are caring directly for those who are sick, like family members, and people who are sick are the ones that have priorities for face masks right now. As face masks become much more uh, commonly available, and they probably will. I know there's many companies, and I know that for here in the United States, that are ramping up to make more of these things, to make them available, and they become affordable again. I would love to see everyone wearing a face mask when they are out in public because it is protective. I've actually seen things where uh, some uh, researchers are saying, well, it doesn't help if you're not a healthcare provider or someone caring for someone sick. You really don't need one. I would love to see their data <laughs> because I think there's a lot to be said for wearing a mask if we have them available. And I think those will come. Um, I would just say if we're not at a point where you easily can have a face mask yet, just be extra careful. Um, when we have face masks available, it will be uh, an additional level of protection that we can all have. I did want to show how to properly wear a surgical mask um, because I've seen physicians on TV in the last uh, two weeks put them on incorrectly. Um, so I have a, a very inexpensive surgical mask here. Uh, normally these come in packs of 50. They're disposable. They're made out of paper and plastic. This is called an ear loop face mask. And you can tell how to put them on because the top side has a little piece of aluminum in it. It's metal. I can actually feel it in here. If I feel on the bottom, there's no metal in it. Okay, so I'm feeling the piece of aluminum. And so that's the upside. And I look at the colors. The outside is blue. The inside is white, and I want the white part against my face. You can also tell because the outside has more of a plasticky feel. The inside is more of a, a light cloth papery feel. Um, so it, it definitely is different, and I hope you got a good shot of that. So I'm going to go ahead and put this face mask on. So I've oriented it in the right way. The blue side is out. The white side is in. I'm going to hold it by the ear loops and put it on my face. Okay, now it's on my face. My next step is I'm going to conform the metal aluminum bar to my nose. So you can see it's sealed very well against my face here. I grab the bottom and I pull it down as far as I can over my chin. So I get a nice expanse of coverage and double check and make sure that the top is sealed against my face as best as I can do it. This is not a perfect seal but it is much better than not having a face mask on. So that's the proper way to orient a surgical face mask, put it on and have it seal well. Um, these do get moisture laden. And so if you're just wearing it while, while, while you are outside in public, when you get home, take them off and dry, just let them air dry and you can use them again. They're probably good for at least eight hours of continuous use. Probably four hours is um, pretty definite for absolute continuous use. One like this is acceptable. Um, but if you're using it intermittently, it actually may last more than a total of four hours. So that's one happy thing about these masks. So I'm going to go ahead and take my mask off now. Notice when I take it off, I take it off by the ear loops. Don't touch my face or the interior of the mask. When I set it down to dry, I put it down with the outside on the table and the inside uh, up, not touching anything. When I go to put it back on, put my ear loops on. Notice I didn't touch the inside of the mask with my fingers, and I just adjust it 
from the outside like that. So that's face masks. One last thing, and I will just say this, I think this is an important attitude for all of us to have in this, that we all need to be um, health warriors. We really wanna look out for one another and have a real altruistic, caring attitude for others. And some of that means we have to be very honest about what kind of symptoms we are having. I've actually had some experience with some of my patients who, when I've told them they really needed to stay in quarantine because they have been potentially exposed to someone with COVID-19, have taken it more as a light recommendation, really rather than something that they must do. And I end up seeing them out driving around in their car or out walking, chatting with people, um, which is putting everyone at risk when they do that. So if the uh, healthcare providers tell you to isolate or quarantine, please do that and do it as carefully as you possibly can. If you are told that your whole region is being quarantined, please do not try to escape. This is one of the things that happened uh, in Italy uh, they had decided they were going to quarantine a portion of northern Italy. This was some days ago. Um, and somehow that news got out before they actually did the quarantine. And many people tried to flee the area, which is exactly the opposite of what we would want them to do. We want them to stay there because if they leave, they're higher risk infection people, they may go to the south of Italy and infect people down there. So I know this is kind of hard news to give people, but we all have to work with this and realize it's not all about us as one person, that we really have to look at this as warriors, as kshatriyas, that we're here trying to help others and care for others. Um, one final thing I would just say uh, is, if you were someone who is 60 years old, chronologically, uh, or older, this is a time for you to stay home. Uh, don't hesitate to ask other people to do shopping for you. Don't hesitate to ask them to do small projects for you so you do not need to go outside unnecessarily. Uh, if you have a job where you would normally go to an office, please try to work out where you could uh, work from home and telecommute. If you look at our medical practice right now, when I start seeing patients on Monday, almost every patient I'm going to see, I'm going to see by video conferencing just like this, except I will see them, they will see me, and we'll have our visit by teleconferencing. Only a handful of patients are going to come to our office because we want to reduce everyone's risk. So if you're 60 or older, please stay home. And um, as a final thing on this, um, you know, make sure you have adequate amounts of food in home, at home so that you don't need to go out every few days to shop, that you have enough that you can stay home if you need to. And if you're someone who takes medication, um, please make sure you have some extra set aside. So if it was not safe to go to the pharmacy for a few weeks, or you were told not to go to the pharmacy for a few weeks, you will not run out of your medications. So that's a very... Um, as complete an explanation as I can give you in a short time today. And um, we may be doing updates on this if we have more to share. So I just wanted to close this by saying, may God bless us all in this and keep yourself safe, keep those around you safe and be a warrior in this and do what you can to help others.